Three days after Christmas in 2010, Laurie Wilcox passed peacefully from this world to the next. She was just 57 years old. Her husband, a beloved Latter-day Saint author and speaker, was left to grieve her passing. In the days and weeks following his wife's death, S. Michael Wilcox wrote many things he was learning from the Lord. Today, 10 years later, we talk with Brother Wilcox about what grief and a loving God have taught him about eternal love. S. Michael Wilcox received his Ph.D. from the University of Colorado and taught for many years at the LDS Institute of Religion adjacent to the University of Utah. He has spoken to packed crowds at BYU Education Week and has hosted tours to the Holy Land, to China, to church history sites, and beyond. He has written many books, including his newest book, What Seek Ye? He and his late wife, Laurie, are the parents of five children. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Jones, and I am honored to have S. Michael Wilcox with me today. Brother Wilcox, thank you so much for welcoming us into your home. Nice to have you here. It's nice to be in a comfortable environment. It is. With you. It's a treat to be here. Well, I asked Brother Wilcox, we're going to be talking today about his new book, What See He? But I asked him because I noticed as I was listening actually to the audio book, I noticed how frequently in the book you refer to your wife, Laurie. And we have done one episode with someone who lost a spouse, but it was still fairly new. And I have always wanted to do another episode because I think that's something that so many people can relate to, whether it's losing a spouse or a child or a loved one. And so I asked Brother Wilcox if he would be up for talking a little bit more about that today. And he said yes and referred me to another book that he wrote called Sunset. And you wrote that book not long after your wife passed away. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. I when I was going through that experience with Laurie, you know, it's the deepest, most life affirming experience I think someone can go through to to see someone you love pass. When that experience was going on, I was writing notes because I knew I was getting a lot of insight about life and and love and eternity, and I didn't want to miss them. I didn't want to forget them. So when she had passed, I went back and pulled all those notes out. And I wrote Sunset based on those experiences. So that was immediate. I wrote that immediately after she passed away. And now it's been a, a decade. I sent a link to that book to my coworkers earlier today. And I said, if you want to believe in true love and read the most beautiful book written on Deseret Bookshelf, you should read this book because it is so, so, so good. So I want to talk a little bit about both of these books, if that's okay today. That's fine. (laughs) To start off, Brother Wilcox, can you tell us a little bit about what happened when your wife had an inoperable brain tumor? Is that right? She had brain cancer. I was doing a time out in Pittsburgh. I got a phone call on the way home that there was an emergency at home. Someone was in the hospital and I didn't know who it was. But as I was flying home, the spirit kept saying, your life is going to change dramatically. And when I got home, Laurie had uh, gone into seizures with a brain tumor. And that's how we found out she had cancer. She died eight months later. So hard. (laughs) In this book, you, like you said, you're writing about the things that you were learning as you went through that experience, both with her sickness and then her passing and kind of grief and the things that, that the Spirit was teaching you. I wrote down a few of the things that I really love that you wrote, and I just want to kind of touch on those as we go through this. One thing that you said is love brings and takes away the fear of death, makes it both foe and friend. How, Brother Wilcox, have you found in the 10 years since Laurie's passing death to be both a foe and a friend? Well, I think the foe part of death is I miss her. I I think about her all the time. I travel to keep my mind focused. 
You know, I travel a lot. Well, with the virus, I can't. So I just get in the car and go. This last week, I went back and went back to the places where we spent our honeymoon, Crater Lake and the Redwoods. I miss her. I think about her all the time. Death took something very precious away from me. That's the faux part. The friend part, one of the questions that Jesus asked, it meant a lot to me, is sleepest thou? It's the shortest question. Sleepest thou? There's a lot of ways that that is applicable to me. But in terms of Lari, first words God said to Adam were, awake and arise. And I always thought that meant, open your eyes and stand up. Uh, Eve has been introduced uh, into his life. But since Laurie's passing, that question, sleepest thou, means so much more because I think I was asleep all those years I had her. I, I was just asleep. I was not awake. And her passing, I woke up and realized what a treasure, what a gift, what a wonderful thing it is for a man to love a woman and a woman to love a man deeply and eternally. And that awake, I say now to God, I'm awake, God, I'm awake. And I'm trying to arise. And so it's been a great friend in deepening that love and in being a great motivator of me to be a better person and be worthy of her. Beautifully said. Another thing that I love is you talk about eternal love and you said, I realized as I turned through, so you're talking about how her mom brought you pictures of Laurie. Right. And you said, I realized as I turned through the pages of her past that I loved her at every age, though I had not met her until she was a freshman in college. I fell in love with the five-year-old in curls and ribbons, the 10-year-old vacationing in Waterton Park, the 15-year-old high school student walking through the snow of Alberta with her books. I had seen these pictures before. They were not new to me, but as I went through her past, I realized a new dimension of eternal love. We speak of the everlasting nature of love, its infinite scope. Only Latter-day Saints truly believe all the love songs and have as their most sacred ordinance the verification of that belief. I always imagine that ceaseless eternal love is stretching down the long corridor of welcoming time past horizons, past setting suns and turning galaxies. But my vision was always a future one of time unspent. Now I feel it pulling me backwards through every memory of her childhood, her growing preparatory years, the seasons of dolls and dances, first lipstick and earrings, times that I did not share with her, but that were now as precious as if I had always known her, always loved her, had never lived without her. And I sense in this backward yearning that when the day comes that veils and closed doors will part and open, the reach of love will encompass all the eons of the past so that eventually there will never be a time when I did not love her. Brother Wilcox, what have you learned about eternal love and the purposes of love in this earth life? Well, I think I tried to write it as best I could. In that you did a beautiful that, job. That, uh, you wrote there that uh, we believe in eternity, and eternity isn't just one direction. Eternity is both directions. Right. I stand in the mirrors in the temple, and uh, I look at one, and it represents past, and I look at the other, the future. And I have learned that uh, love grows, love deepens. And I might say all of eternity will not be enough for me to fulfill my love for her. It it won't be enough. Maybe God gives us eternity so we can fill it with love because, I mean, and not just love for a wife, a husband, but love for children, love for one another, love for God, love for Christ. Uh, Jesus' uh, love is broad as eternity, we're told in Moses 7. He, his empathy, the rock, is the rock of his love, his mercy. And it's, it's as wide as eternity. And I think I have learned that it will take eternity to fulfill all the n- corners that my love for her will present 
it'll take that much time. And we'll feel that for everybody. It'll take that much time to learn to love God and feel his love for us. It'll take that much time to learn our love for our children, our grandchildren, and feel their love for us and, and of our Savior. Eternity is a big place. It's infinite because God's love is infinite. He, he, he has to create. He has to create because his love is infinite. And since there's no end of his love, there'll be no end of what he creates. Yeah. How did you first meet Laurie? Oh, it was a typical BYU, you know. <laughs> uh, my patriarch, you know, I didn't believe I'd ever marry anybody wonderful. Who was I, for heaven's sake? I was nobody. I had no, I was nicknamed the frog uh, because I never kissed a girl to be a happy, uh, handsome prince. <laughs> and uh, I went to BYU. And my patriarchal blessing told me that I would in time, if I kept myself clean and pure and, and good, that I would meet someone likewise, three words, pure, clean, and undefiled. I got into the ward. Uh, I, I saw her on the doorstep. I knew her sister. And I, as soon as I saw her, I, I loved her. And she bore testimony in church shortly thereafter. And uh, I could hear the spirit in my mind say those words, likewise, pure, clean, and undefiled. And I leaned over to my roommate and nudged him, whom my mother was paying $20 for every date he could get me on because I just had no confidence. <laughs> he got 20 bucks for every date he could get me on. I turned to him and I said, Walter, I'm, I'm going to marry that girl. And uh, he was stunned. I think he could see his $20 disappearing. But... I don't know that the Lord was saying, I picked her for you. Here she is, Mike. I think he was saying, don't sell yourself short. You've tried to do right and good. And if this is the kind of a person you want, then you try. And so I started, I asked her out and standard BYU, well, you went, you know, six weeks later, I asked her to marry me. It was not, didn't take me very long, you know. So that's how I met her. A great story. Another part in the book that I love is in this section, you're talking about how you give an example of her losing earrings. And you say she always only could find one pair, one, one of the earrings. And, but you talk yeah. about how after she passed, those single earrings like even that filled you with love for her. And you said, we should love people for what they are at their very best, the totality of all their highest moments from every age. This is the real person, the eternal one, the one we are to remember and hold dear. What has the loss of Laurie in this life taught you about loving people as they are and appreciating them for who they are, even in our mortal imperfection? Well, I mean, the, 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 the earrings thing used to be an annoyance, you know, uh, like her, her addiction to bracelets. <laughs> uh, she had to have bracelets. But, you know, they become endearments later on. And I, I think that's probably true for a lot of things. I think that quote is from Sunset, the one you just gave. Uh -huh. uh, yes, sir. One of the questions, uh, or one of the that I deal with in the Jesus asks is why do you look at the motes in other people's eyes? And I think sometimes we answer because they're there. I can see them and I can just hear the Lord say, yes, I know they're there, but why are you looking at them? We should not be looking at those things, but we live in a real moat picking world. It's, it's a disease now where we're always looking at the negative. And so when Laurie died, uh, I, I, I tell this story I, in Sunset. I went to Antarctica uh, such a beautiful place to heal, and Laurie loved Antarctica. So I went down there, and my daughter said, we will clean out mother's things when you're gone because that'll be painful for you, and her clothes and all her bracelets and single earrings. And, <laughs> and I said, no, because there'll be things I want. I'll want those single earrings and those bracelets, and there'll be a certain hairbrush, and I'll want these things. But when we get, I get back, we'll do them together. So we did. We started in the closet upstairs and went all the way down. Laurie saved everything. I threw everything away. I was, uh, 
she just saved everything. And we threw a lot away. And there were things I wanted and things the kids wanted. And when I was done cleaning the whole house, and I was sitting in bed late one night, and the Spirit said, Michael, there's another cleansing I want you to do now. It is a cleansing of the memory and the heart and the soul of every negative you ever shared with this woman. Throw them all away. Every moat and every beam I want you to throw away. So I get to remember Laurie Howe in absolute perfection. She was the most feminine, most perfect woman God ever put on earth. That's the way I remember her. No moats, no beams. She had no moats. I have to deal with my own beams, you know. I have to deal with, uh, that's a fear I have. It's a question I dealt with here. Why are you so fearful? I'm afraid she won't want me, you know. I'm afraid I'll have too many beams for her moatless soul. And after having that experience of cleansing the memory of all moats, of all the negatives, a few months later, the Spirit came back and said, Now, Michael, what you did with Laurie, whom you love so much, I want you to do with everybody. Throw all the moats and all the beams away. Don't hold in your heart or your mind any of those negatives. We, th- we throw them all away. The best you, the real you, sometimes now I know the real you. The real you is you at your best. All the best moments put together makes the real you, the you you God sees, the, the you he wants us to see. It doesn't mean that we don't have to make assessments of people's characters and how much we trust them and what they, we, we do make all those assessments. But we want to see them and the very best. I think it's a gift God gives women. I think he gave it to Laurie, certainly, to see the men they love, to see their children at their very best. And because they see us that way, we try to live up to it. We try to arise. So that's helped me to not moat pick and answer Jesus' question, why are you doing this? And to say, Lord, I'm not doing it. I, I learned not to do it with Laurie. You taught me I'm not going to do it with anybody else. Although occasionally in our political world, I do mope pick. Right. <laughs> I, think, I think everybody does. Yeah. Another thing that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is grief. I think you, you say a few things that I think are so helpful. You talk about how grief physically hurts. You talk about how it caused you to question the things that you believe. These are things that you've devoted your life to teaching about. And you, you talk about how it surprised you that you felt that you had these questions. And I think that causes even deeper emotional pain. I know in my life, when I've gone through things that were hard, and I felt bitterness toward God or questioning God, that almost hurt even more than what I was going through because I hated feeling that way. And so talk to me a little bit about what you have learned about grief. Well, I I think grief is love's shadow. If we didn't love, we wouldn't grieve. And therefore, I would increase the grief a hundredfold to have the love increase a hundredfold. But grief did, in my case, it doesn't for all people, grief did cause me to question all at once, all my happiness hung on my belief, hung on temple ordinances and sealing powers and uh, promises Joseph Smith made and taught in scriptures, all my happiness. Is there a Laurie? And is she still my Laurie? And I use a couple of images. One is of a rope with knots in it. And it used to be very easy to hold on. My rope of faith had knots in it. I could hold on. And when she died, they unraveled. And I just had to grip tighter. I, you know, Joseph Smith is told in Liberty Jail, when he's questioning, hold on my way, just hold on. The other image is of a path. Uh, my 
faith of path was wide and easy to walk. Lots of good things happening, lots of blessings. And sometimes things happen in our life that our path narrows. You read something on the internet, a blessing doesn't come that you want. We all have crisis of faith, whatever, something happens. And the path seems to narrow. And there's a beautiful verse in Habakkuk where he talks about God giving him the hooves of a hind or an ibex or a mountain goat so he can walk on those narrow, tiny little ledges when faith becomes like a tiny ledge on a cliff where the, a misstep would send you to a fall. You pray for Heinz feet. Mm-hmm. And I pray, God, give me those feet and, and I will walk. And, and he does. And because the path widens again, you know, the path, I still wrestle with, Will she still want me, you know? But he has a question again. I, why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful, Michael? He asks that when he's in the boat, you know, in the storm. And the implication is I'm in the boat with you. I'm not, I'm not up there looking down. I'm in the boat with you. Don't be so fearful. It's okay to be fearful. Just don't be so fearful. Don't be so fearful. Yeah. Um, You'll see her again, and she'll be all you want her to be. Love is eternal. That's a solid part of my path, but it's something grief has caused me to deal with. Yeah. Another thing that you write about in relation to grief in Sunset is you talk about how there's no roadmap to tell us how far we are or how near we are to that desired and you say, and yet not desire destination of healing, peace and relief. And I think that's so true. I think when we're in the thick of grief, we never know how long is it going to take me to feel better? You later say that perhaps our inability to say goodbye is an indication that we do not need to say it because there is no such finality. What have you found in the last 10 years about the timeline of grief? Well, time went exceedingly slow the first years because I would think I'm not, I'm 60. I was 60, you know, I'm 70 now, but I could live three decades. And every day feels long. And every day is long. Um, I can remember the first year thinking, It's been an eternity. It's only a year. I may have 34 more of them. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. And probably those first three, four, even five years just seemed slow, slow, slow. And I stayed busy. I traveled 250 days a year to be on the road to deal with it. The second five years, time has normalized. It's, uh, it's not so slow anymore. And I actually sense it's speeding up. And the next 10 years, I, you know, I, I tall, called the one book Sunset. Uh, I say to my children, I'm going to run into the sunset because that's where she is. In my mind, Laurie's in the sunset. I look at a sunset, that's, that's where she is. And I'll run to it. So I think that those the last 10 years of my life, whether I die at 85 or 90, I don't know, or maybe I'll die tomorrow, um, it's going faster. Um, and so for those who are new in their grief, it's going to be slow. I, it, it's just what it is but it seems to accelerate. And the older I get now and the more time passes, the faster it goes. Thank heaven. Yeah. Thank heaven. 
Another thing that I love, and this kind of goes back to the running into the sunset idea, but you said endurance is what God asks of us and endure we must, but it need not be a distressing endurance. We hold on until reunion ends our wanting. It is not easy, but we feel the love while we wait and love is always a good thing to fill a heart. And I love the way that you put that. I think waiting is something that everybody can relate to, whether it's waiting to see a spouse again in your case or waiting for healing or waiting to find someone to marry. I think that these are all things that people wait for. Life in many ways is a waiting space. What have you found about waiting? We learn no matter what you're waiting for, it's as if maybe the Lord is saying, I know you want this, whether it's to be married, a reunion with somebody, an answer to a prayer. I'm dealing with a man now who's just doesn't know why God won't talk to him anymore. So whatever we're waiting for, you learn. You take that time to learn. We're down here to learn. Life is a brief blink of eternity. Eternity and and to use a college maybe analogy, maybe this is compassion one hundred and one, and suffering one hundred and one, and agency one hundred and one, or good and evil one hundred and one, or but it certainly is love one hundred and one. And one of the things that no matter what we're waiting for, that we are to learn here and now in this time period is to love, to love ourselves, to love our Father in heaven, to love each other, to love family, to forgive, to feel compassion, to feel empathy. Eve says it is better for us to pass through sorrow that we may, I like to change her word, that we may learn we may learn. So we, we, we're we going to pass through it. Whatever grief, whatever trial, whatever thing we're waiting for, we'll pass through it. We're going to get through it. This is going to be over for me. Mary at the tomb looked at the empty tomb. No Jesus. The, the epitome of grief for me is Mary Magdalene resurrection morning. And in one brief word, Jesus simply calls her name Mary. And she turns and all the grief is gone in a burst of joy. And that'll happen to all of us, whatever we wait for. I say to people, every good thing in life is on the straight and narrow path. Everything you want is on that path. Just stay on the path. And everything you want, you'll receive. God's plan is a plan of happiness. He's going to get us happy. And one day he'll say to me, Mike, why weepest thou? I'll say, because I miss Laurie. And he'll call my name, Michael, and I'll turn like Mary did a resurrection morning. And there she'll be. And it will be over. It will be over. Waiting is over. It's over. Grief is over. Happiness is the destiny. Until that comes, learn. We learn. We learn to love and forgive and to feel compassion and kindness. We, we learn. That reminds me of something that you talk about in What Seek Ye. You say, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, that our God is a God of happy endings. Is that what you that's say? That's correct. Yeah. And I, I think that that is so true. And that's what he wants to give us. But we are meant to learn things along the way. And sometimes that means passing through those difficult experiences and then being able to look back and be like, I made it through that. And maybe that comes in this life. Maybe it comes in the next. But I think that that is a beautiful way of putting it, that our God is a God who wants to give us every happy ending. Yeah. One of the questions I really love about Jesus is, what shall I say? I mean, I love a lot of his questions, but that one really hits me. He said, now is my hour come. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. 
that's true of all of us. We all, you know, when we come to our hour, our moment of pain, trial, whatever, we all might say, Father, save me from this hour. I cried that. Save us from this hour, Lord. But we came to earth for these hours. We came to learn. We came to experience. And we have to trust that he's going to know when to save and when not to save. Jesus himself cried out in Gethsemane, save me from this hour. But he trusted God. There'll be a happy ending. There'll be only happy endings for all of us. We're all going to get, I'm going to get my happy ending. I still wrestle with fear. But in my best times, as I sit here talking to you, I will have that happy ending. It's going to come because we believe in a God of happy endings. Thank you. Another thing in what Siki, so like I said, the thing that struck me as I was going through this was how often Laurie entered into these questions that Christ asks. And so in this book, you explore all the many of the questions that Christ asks in the New Testament. How did the loss of your wife lead to your exploration of these questions? Well, I don't know that, that there's a direct connection between that. Okay. Um, I just think Laurie is always in my mind, so whatever. I mean, she's always there. She's in every cell of my body. I don't, I don't know where in me I would say she's not. I don't know where I would, would say she's not. So whatever I write or do, she generally comes to the surface. But I like to look at the scriptures differently sometimes And uh, it hit me that most of my life I have thought that God was the questioner or that I was the questioner and God was the answerer. We're always saying we go to God for answers, go to God for answers. I'm looking for answers to my prayer. And I think the Lord finally said, Mike, you've learned, you've learned that relationship now. Let's, let's try another one. Uh, I'm the questioner and you're the answerer. And when that idea hit that maybe I had it backwards, that the most important thing wasn't that I had questions for God and he had answers for me. The most important thing was that he had questions and I had to answer them. And so then I went to the life of the Savior. Once that idea hit and said, okay, I'm going to underline every question Jesus asks and assume that he's asking it to me personally. And not every question struck me. But as I went through it, you know, and I couldn't get all the ones I loved into, I tried to mingle a bunch of questions. But it struck me that so many of those questions caused me to love him deeper and became much more personal, my relationship with him. If I could answer those questions, uh, my love increased. Even, even the question, lovest thou me? He asked to Peter, if you let him ask that question to you personally, Michael, do you love me? Uh, it's such a wonderful thing to answer that question and to say, yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. So it, was, it wasn't Laurie's passing that motivated the writing of the book about the questions of Jesus, what seek ye? But she's always there. And so many of those questions became very personal to me in my relationship with Laurie and my grieving and my missing of her. So many of those questions impacted that area. Not all of them, but so many of them. Mm -hmm. Like like the mode and the beam question. You know, who would have linked those two? Right. So that that's kind of how that that came out. I Now I find that if I can answer God's questions to me, I don't have very many for him anymore. The relationship's changed when I'm the answerer and not God the answerer. Fascinating. How, as you have delved into the study of the Savior's questions, have you found that, because I think many times when a question is asked asked of someone, it's because we're seeking to 
understand. So sometimes these questions that the Savior asked were of other people, like it would the example of Peter. Sometimes they were questions that he was asking of God, but I think he was asking to understand. And so what have you what have you learned about how he seeks to know us and understand us by asking questions? I I think he probably knows and understands us perfectly. Um it's me learning to know and understand myself mm-hmm. that is the critical factor in the questions and me learning to understand my relationship with my Father in Heaven and the Savior that becomes the critical factor. Um, his questions cause us, certainly me, to go deep into our hearts and into our minds and into our lives and to see things in there that I think he already sees. Like the question, when Mary anoints him and with the oil and the apostles complain that should, she's wasted it, should have given it to the poor. And this is, I'm sure it was, she was sensitive. She thought she was doing good things. She's getting criticized for it. And the Savior's question is, why trouble ye her? Why, why are you troubling her? Now, for years, I just read that as a lovely story in the New Testament. All of a sudden, you know, I can see the Savior looking at me and saying to me, Michael, why, why do you trouble other people? Everybody's doing the best they can. Why trouble each? Why, why are we troubling each other so much? Why are we filled with indignation, as in the scriptures, and murmured at her? We live in a moat-picking, filled with indignation, murmuring world. And two of Jesus' questions have pretty much cured that for me. Once I, I'm not perfect in it, I'm, I still can be filled with indignation and murmur, and I can still moat pick. But I don't do it very long, and as soon as I find myself doing it, I quit. Um, so it's, it's not me understanding more about him that the questions have done. It's me understanding some things he wants me to see in myself and in others. And I've loved him because the questions have made me a better person. One thing that I really appreciated is how you talk throughout Sunset about how you want, when you see Laurie again, to be good enough And I think that that's something that all of us wrestle with, whether it be with somebody that we love and long to see again. In my case, it would probably be my grandma. Or when we see the Savior again, we want to be what we want to have learned what he wanted us to learn. What do you feel like you hope that Laurie sees when you see her again? Oh, wow. Wow. Well, I, I would like her to see perfection, but she's not going to see it. I think what I hope Laurie would see is how hard I'm trying to be what she wants me to be. Because I know she tried very hard to be what I wanted her to be. And that that's what we would see in one another. I'm sure she's not perfect either, although I can't think of any flaw in her. She could point them out herself, but I would, I would want her to see that I'm trying to be everything not only that God wants to see in me so that I can please him as Jesus pleased him, but that what she would like to see in me, I'm I'm trying and I want to, and I'm going to get there. And I hope she would see how deeply that I love her. You know, I, when we were dating, I was 22. I was stupid. You're stupid at 22. <laughs> and she asked me, because I was an English major, and I had to write papers and read big novels like War and Peace. And I wasn't spending as much time with her as she thought I should. And And in tears one day, she said to me uh, in a conversation, we're engaged, don't you need me? And I wouldn't have used that verb. 
I would say, I love you. I, I want you. I, I, but need, I'm not sure I need anything or anybody. And she, she cried. Now I would say, Laurie, ask me that question again. Now I know how to answer it. I didn't know how to answer it at 22. I was stupid. Now I would say, I need you like sunshine and air. I, I need you. And I would hope she would see not only that I love her and want her, but that she's needed. And uh, I would hope I'd see that in her. I love you and I want you, Mike. And I need you. I think it's interesting. So we've been talking about the questions of Christ and I feel like it kind of came full circle with that because you're talking about a question that she asked you. And I think we all have questions, whether we're asking questions of God, seeking for answers to our deepest questions or asking questions of other people. My last question before we get to the last question would be, what have you learned about what makes a good question? I think as I study the Savior's questions, his questions, uh, we kind of talked about a little bit, his questions always invite one to go deep into the soul. Uh, they don't, they're not cognitive answer. We're not, we, he's not looking for a cognitive answer. He's looking for an examination of the heart, who I am, what I am, my relationship with other people. It's like the parables. The parables aren't doctrinal. The parables are stories that, that are to invite me to see, am I what I should be? Am I living the way I want to live? One of the questions I love of his is when they ask, somebody asks him, and it happens more than once, what do I have to do to gain eternal life? Well, that's a big question. What do I have to do to gain eternal life? And I've thought about all the ways people answer that, how I would answer that. Oh, we have to have the right ordinances, the right religion, we have to do this or that, all the things we have to do eternal life. He answers it with a parable, the Good Samaritan. How do you, how do you gain eternal life? You, you do the big two. You love God with all your heart, mind, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor. It's that simple. It's not about all this other stuff that we answer about how you gain eternal life. You gain eternal life by loving one another and loving God. And that is a, a, when that's talked about, when the question is asked him, he's a good Jew. Good Jews, it's it's part of the tradition to answer questions with a question, okay? He says, what do the scriptures say? How readest thou? How do you answer the question, what do I have to do to gain eternal life? What do you find in the scriptures? And the way people, what people find in the scriptures tells you a great deal about them and the religion. What we want to find with that question is the two great loves. But he lets us search for it. How, I love that. How readest thou? And we have to go deep in. So a good question, as I teach, you know, I try and ask questions that will draw some self-examination and and a deeper understanding of the God we love and the Savior we love and what they want of us. Yeah, thank you. My last question for you, Brother Wilcoxon, I just want to thank you. Thank you for being so open and for sharing these things that are in your heart with our listeners. I hope that they'll be helpful to people that will listen. I know I've certainly been touched by them. So thank you. My last question is, what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, it means a lot of things, I guess. I think in our conversation, For me, uh, it's a path back to the God I love. It's a path to the Savior I love. And it's a path to the woman I love. And I'm all in because I want those relationships. Uh, So that's 
one of the things that, that to, to be all in is to know where, what you want, where, what's at the end of the path. Just too many people get on paths. They don't know what's at the end of the path. I know exactly what's at the end of the path I want. I don't walk the path as good as I'd like to, but I know where the path goes if I can stay on it and what I want at the end of that path. And ask my father in heavens uh, that he'd be pleased with me and my Savior's love, that I'll get to have the opportunity the Nephites did of touching the tokens of his atonement and knowing And the first token is the heart, the wound in the side. Can you imagine what that would be like to touch the Savior's side by his heart? And know that you, as the song says, hold a place within that heart. And I want to be with Laurie. I want to always be with Laurie. I don't want to ever be separated from her again. This is a painful thing. It's going to hurt until I see her again. So all in means those three relationships. And, you know, my mother's there and uh, my ancestors who I'm grateful for. And the other thing it means is uh, traveling has taught me that there is so much goodness in the world. I probably started out on my path in life thinking God kind of talked to the apostles and prophets and the Book of Mormon and then there was a restoration and but I didn't know much else that was out there. Uh, traveling and learning about all the different religions and beliefs and faith and literatures and musics, mythologies and uh, natural beauties of the world. Now I would say to you, God has been talking to his children every way he can, all the time, everywhere. And if you can't listen to an apostle or a prophet, Maybe you can listen to a sage or a philosopher or a musician or a poet or a playwright or an artist. Or you'll see God in the lives of good people all over. And so the phrase all in also means not that I'm all in, but that I'm going to, I get to bring all in, all the goodness of the world I get to bring into my soul and my life, whether I find it in a Catholic saint or a Chinese sage or a Renaissance artist or a New England poet. All that comes in. All that comes into my life. And the gospel is an all-in gospel. We need to be all in on that path, knowing what it is we want. I know exactly what I want. And I also want my children and grandchildren there. And the privilege that I have of searching humanity, history, and finding that there is no end to goodness on this earth. And there will never be an end to goodness. And there's just so much I can't fit it all in my heart and brain. They're just not enough. From, I know I'll need in eternity to fit it all in. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Thank you, Brother Wilcox, for taking the time to be with me today. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's been wonderful talking. It's, I, I think the, the final thought of a ma- marvelous Muslim man, a dear friend of mine who loved Laurie a great, great deal. And after she died and I went to see him in Egypt, uh, he let me talk about her like you have today. And when we were done, uh, he said, you know, Mike, for us Muslims, when you talk lovingly about those who have passed, you lift them to higher and higher places in paradise. And so I thank you for letting me lift Lari to a higher place in paradise. My pleasure. By being able to talk about it with you. Thank Thank you. you. 
We are so grateful to S. Michael Wilcox for joining us on today's episode. You can find both What Seek Ye and Sunset on DeseretBook.com now. Also, we're very excited that What Seek Ye is the September LDS Living Book Club Book of the Month. So if you want to follow along with us there, be sure to check that out on Instagram. Thank you to Derek Campbell of Mix at Six Studios for making us sound good. And thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, could you do me a big favor and leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcast. We would be so grateful. And in return, we will be back again next week with another great episode. We'll look forward to being with you then.